too. If you have your Bibles with you today, I would ask you to turn to that psalm. If you have your iPhones, your iPad, uh, turn to this scripture because we're going to read it. We're going to take a few minutes about and, and think about and talk about putting on our game face. It's very important. Here was a man in Psalms 32 talking about David, a great man that was going through a dry spell in his life. And we're going to look to see how he handled that dry spell. What did he do when it seemed like God wasn't anywhere near him? And so we're going to put the scripture up on the screen, and I want to read through Psalms 42. I may skip over a couple verses uh, for sake of time. It's not that they're not important, but uh, follow along with me in your, your iPhone, your iPad. Uh, I'll be reading from the Amplified Version this morning. As the heart pants and longs for the water brook, so I pant and long for you, O God. He's uh, using metaphorical uh, terms here in this scripture. And in a few minutes, he's going to be explaining what that means. In verse number two, he says, My inner self thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night. While men say to me all day long, where is your God? Not only did men say that, it wasn't long until David began to believe that in his own heart. In verse number four, these things I earnestly remember and pour myself out within me. How I went slowly before the throng, led them in procession to the house of God like a bandmaster before his band, timing the steps to the sound of the music and the chant of song with the voice of shouting and praise, a throng-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O oh, my inner self? And why should you moan over me and be disquieted within me? Hope in God and wait expectantly for him, for I shall yet praise him, my help, and my God. Oh my God, my life is cast down upon me, and I find the burden more than I can bear. Therefore, while I earnestly remember you from the land of the Jordan River, and the summits on the Mount Hermon, from the little mountain Mizar, as with a sword crushing in my bones, my enemies taunt me and reproach me, while they say continually to me, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my inner self? Why should you moan, verse number 11, why should you moan over me and be disquieted within me? Hope in God, wait expectantly from him, for I shall yet praise him. And the last statement that he makes is one that is so valuable. Who is the help of my countenance and my God? And he says that my God is the one that gives me a game face a spiritual game face. Interesting, as we look at the scripture today, when you go to the dictionary and define a game face, it's a confident swagger that you have when you're getting ready to go into a great challenge. You're getting ready to do something that is very, very significant. It's a certain type of a swagger that you have. You know, we're getting ready for football season. You all like football? Yes, I know. Wow, Kansas City doing a great job, aren't they? Well, you know, football, I love the National Football League. I really do. I watch it all the time. And I love to watch college football. But you know what I get most excited about? You drive through the country, little towns and cities. Friday night, you see the lights begin to shine, and they're playing high school football. Nothing like high school football. You talk about a swagger? You have it out of Clearwater, don't you? Yeah, everybody swaggers. Somebody's talking about campus, you know, we're going to have a good team this year. Coaches are excited. They're even making posters and getting everybody excited. There's a certain uh, game face that you'll bring to the football game. It's a certain swagger that you have. We're going to beat somebody tonight. We're going to win. It's going to be exciting. And uh, so that's what a game face is all about. But here was a man, David, that didn't have that excitement in his life. And I want to approach this today talking about the game face, not only of us as individuals, but also as a church. You see, a church has a game face. 
when people walk in here on Sunday mornings and they look around, sometimes they might ask the question if our game face isn't on, wow, I wonder where God was there today. I sure didn't sense him. So we're going to talk about how my game face and how yours affects the game face of our entire church. In the psalm, each one of them have a little note on the top of the psalm by the chapter number, and it's addressed to somebody. This particular psalm is addressed to the musician, to the choir director, Machiel, for the son of Korah. Now, you see it on the screen, and sometimes we overlook that little statement at the beginning of a psalm. What was it written for? Well, maskil, to define that, means instructions. Instructions in wisdom. And so it was written to him for instructions for us as we read Psalms 42. It's not just another psalm. Uh, yesterday we had a funeral service, and I read the 23rd psalm. It's not just the 23rd psalm. It has great meaning to it has great value to our lives. And so, maskil, it's instructions. And so God wants to instruct us about situations that happen in our lives. It's about an experience. It's about a metaphor. It's about having the blues. I love the blues. I would like to have a blues station on my radio in my car so I can listen to the blues and and jazz, and, and those types of songs. I, I love that type of music. And when you think about the blues, you think, well, it originated in St. Louis, the St. Louis Blues, right? Isn't that where the blues came from? Maybe New Orleans, but they think about the St. Louis Blues. But in reality, it happened in the Mount Mysir, up by the Sea of Galilee, and David originated the blues. I didn't know that. But this man, a great king, a great leader, he has the blues. You probably don't know anything about the blues. You probably have never had them. But in case you, you know, if you're in that category, I'm going to talk to the other people, okay? But here's the blues, the St. Louis blues. Now, John Maxwell in his uh, study Bible, he, he talks about the scripture, and he, he has a leadership Bible, and he talks about leaders oftentimes uh, find themselves thirsty. They find themselves uh, in this type of a situation where it's not exciting. There's nothing that motivates them. And, and so uh, we have to realize that just because we're pastors or we're leaders doesn't mean that we don't go through times such as this. I watch our own pastor uh, work and uh, been working with him for seven years, and I guarantee he's not a lazy man. Uh, I look at him and I thought, man, I'd have got out of the ministry a long time ago if I had to do everything that he does. He counsels, he does this, he's just busy, very busy man. And sometimes we get tired. And sometimes it happens even to great leaders. We're not motivated. And what I like about what John Maxwell says about Psalms 42 is he talks about the humanity in this psalm. Just human beings. And sometimes we think as human beings that you know, we're great, and nothing's ever going to happen to us, and we're going to be spiritual giants all of our life, and you look at us, you know, we're almost to where God is in spirituality, and we get to thinking that way sometimes, but this is humanity. This is somebody that was really panting after the things of God, and so I want to take just a few minutes to uh, talk about what it's teaching us as people and how God works in our life how we respond to those dry times in our lives. And we want to take a moment to look at a few things. In the physical world, we have what they call trainers and doctors. Trainers are those that uh, you go to the YMCA or wherever it is you go. Trainers are the ones that help us grow physically. They give us a plan. They talk to us about nutrition. They give us a schedule for exercise. You're looking at me like you don't know anything about nutrition and exercise. But they do that. That's what trainers do. They, they help you grow. They train you. But there are times in your training and in your physical health that you become sick and you're ill. And if you go to the trainer, it's not going to help you. Uh, now you have to see the doctor. And the doctor comes into your life, and, 
and he takes your life and he helps to bring you back on track to where you were. The trainer helped you to grow, but when you are ill and you're sick physically, you get off track and then you go to the doctor, he brings you back and puts you on track. Well, the same thing is true with spiritual life. We have what we call trainers and doctors. Trainers are the disciplines that we call reading your Bible, praying, meditating, fasting, going to church, giving. They are things that we do, we learn to do as a Christian to help us to grow spiritually. We call them trainers or we call them disciplines. And so they help us along, they grow us spiritually. But as David is found in this scripture, he became sick, he was ill. And so he's not going to go to the trainer. He needs to see the doctor. The doctor. The doctor can help bring him back on track. Now what happens many times, and you find this to be true, if you're going through a dry time in your life, in your spiritual life, the first thing people will say to you, they'll come up to you and they'll say, Oh, you need to read your Bible more. I know what you need. You need to pray maybe 30 minutes a day instead of 15. And what you need to do, you need to start going to church. In other words, we always fall back to the trainers. We think, well, if I just start reading my Bible more, I'm going to get myself out of here. Now, I'm not against reading the Bible or I'm not against praying, but I want to tell you something. Those times that I've had a dry spell, I didn't even want to pick up my Bible. And um, I know it doesn't sound spiritual. I'm just telling you the humanity of it, okay? And, and so um, we go back to the trainers all the time. That's the way we try to help people. When I went through a real dry point in my life, 1983, pastors said, well, you just need to start reading your Bible more and just start praying more and everything. Pick yourself up with your shoestrings and, you know, the trainers will really kick in. No, I needed a doctor. I needed a doctor. <laughs> I needed something more than, than the trainers. I need to read my Bible. I'm not saying that. And so that's what we find in this scripture, that every time we find ourselves in a dry place in our lives, we must go back to the trainers instead of going to the doctor and let him take care of us. So let's break this scripture down just a little bit. In verse 1, 2, and 3, number 1, the condition. We're going to look at his condition. He had lost the face of God. Notice in verse number 2, my inner self thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? When can I see the face of God? He lost the countenance of God. He lost his game face. When can I see the face of God? I cannot even see the face of God. Now listen, it wasn't that he was living a life of sin. He wasn't. It was something that just naturally came into his life. Now there are Psalms and there are scripture that will show us a picture of a man or a woman that's been living in sin and they lose the face of God because of that sin. But this man is not doing that. You see, the picture that you have here is a deer, a panting deer that is running to the river. A deer is smart. They know where the water's at. They know where the creek, the river, the pond is, and they're going for the water. And the deer is probably being chased and he's panting. Remember the song we just got through singing? as the deer panted, and it gets there, and the river is dried up. That's the metaphor that he gives us in verse number one. But then he, he defines that for us, and he says, as David, I am the deer, I've run to God, who is the river, and it's dry. Nothing there. He lost the face of God. Believe me, I've been there before. I lost the face of God. Not only did he lose the face of God, secondly, he lost the very presence of God. He lost the very presence of God. In verse number three, he says, My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? I've lost the very presence of God. I don't feel like I have a hold of him any longer. I can't see him. I can't touch him. I just, I can't hear him. I've lost the presence of God. Not because he's living in sin. It's not because he doesn't believe God. That's the humanity is just where he is at. He had lost the presence of God. It just seemed like there was no personal relationship there with God. 
You've been there before, I'm sure. You've had those times in your life when you've lost the face of God, the very presence of God. You're wondering why? Because you're not living in sin? Why is this happening? Thirdly, he was experiencing spiritual drought. Experiencing spiritual drought. He's looking for God. He's thirsty. He's dry. Darkness. The drought. It is um, a terrible place to be. Maybe you're a new Christian here today. Maybe you've been a Christian for a year or two. One of the dangers that we'd like to warn you about is this. Oftentimes when you become a Christian, everybody thinks, well, life is going to be great from here on out. The fact of the matter is it probably won't be. Because now you have some new guidelines that you're living by. And it'll probably be very difficult to live by them because it doesn't follow the guidelines of the culture that you're living in. And so if you're a new Christian, we want to warn you that there will be a time that you will probably have a dryness in your life. It probably seemed like, well, you know, when I first got saved, I was excited and had this game face on, had this, this swagger, this confidence, and all of a sudden, wow, I don't have it any longer. Well, let me say to you, if that's you, a new Christian, that don't give up because uh, God, uh, he's there, and it isn't anything that maybe you have done, but it's just a dry spot in your life. It's a, it's a drought in your life, and we want to help you to teach you how to overcome that drought in your life. And there may be people sitting here right now that you're in a drought. You're in a dry spell in your spiritual life. It just scares us to death. Now, I know, I, I've talked to people that, I, you know, they say, well, that's never happened to me. I say, yeah, sure, yeah. Go ahead, just tell me all about it. Never happened to me. It will happen to a certain degree to everybody eventually. It's just a dryness, it's a drought. I would venture to say there may be people sitting here today that maybe you've been going to church for 30, 40, 50 years. You raised your children in church. I've seen this happen so many times. We preachers get up and we say, boy, if you raise your kids, you do this and this and this and this. Boy, they're going to be perfect little angels. They'll never go astray. Everything will be great. But what happened, there may be people sitting here right now that your children did go astray. And it affected you. And you didn't know what to do with it. You may still come to church. Because you never knew really how to deal with it. Because somebody told you, oh, just read the Bible more. Just pray more. Do this and do that. And so if that's you today, you don't have to stay there. I've pastored many a people that came to church Sunday after Sunday that had a game face on at one time. After 30 years, They'd walk in, you'd think you'd baptize them with dill pickle juice. I mean, they, they just no game face, no swagger. they just walk in and sit down, grumpy, just, uh, just didn't like life. You say, what happened? Well, they lost the face of God. They lost the presence of God. It just wasn't there. There was a dryness that fell upon their lives. The second thing I want to look at is maybe some causability factors of why this happens. Uh, we find this with David. Uh, the first one is that he was disconnected from community. He was disconnected from community. And let me read uh, verse number four of this scripture. It says, These things I earnestly remember and pour myself out within me, how I went slowly before the throng and led them in the process to the house of God. And he remembers all that when he was at the house of God in Jerusalem. But now in verse number six, it says, Oh my God, my life is cast down upon me, and I find the burden more than I can bear. Therefore, I earnestly remember you from the land of the Jordan River and the summits of Mount Hermon from the little mountain Mizar. So now instead of being in Jerusalem, he's not with community now. He was in Jerusalem. There he was going to the house of God. There he had a swagger. I mean, there a spiritual, they had festivities there. But now he's way up north up above the Sea of Galilee, up around Mount Hermon, up on the mountain of Mizar. He's not with community. And so he's disconnected from community. One of the things, causabilities of dryness in our life is not being connected to community. Now, we live in an individualistic society today. I don't need church. I don't need you. I'm okay. 
I can do it. You hear a lot of that in the political world today, don't you? I don't need anything. I'm okay. I'm all right. And so we're very individualistic. And so I don't need church. I don't need your comfort. I don't need what you have to offer. And the fact of the matter is, that's not the way God made us. And that's not the way God designed the church. And that's not the way God designed Christianity. He designed Christianity for us to be together as a body. It's called a body of believers. And if we're disconnected from that, I guarantee you. Now, there are times when people are ill and they can't come to church, can't be in the body. There are times when people are in a nursing home. They can't get connected. But I'm talking about most of us. We just make a choice not to go to church. And, and therefore, uh, we come up with a dryness in our life community. So let me put a plug in for our community groups, okay? Uh, Brennan's going to be coming pretty soon. He's got the table set up. One of the greatest things that you could do to overcome dryness in your life is to get disconnected or to get connected with people. One of the ways you do that is through these community groups. That's what it's about, so you can be connected. And the other way you can do it is always be here in church, in this worship service. Now don't miss uh, twice a month or something like that. Just be here. That's, uh, you know, you can miss twice a month, but I guarantee you the swagger won't be what it should be. It just won't be. And so uh, that, uh, that disconnect, he was disconnected from the people that he was associated with. Now he's up in the north, and uh, he's looking for God, and he can't find him. And that's what will happen to you and happen to me. If I'm not really involved in our church, in our community groups, our classes, getting our young people in the young people's department, our kids in the kids' department. Don't let your kids dry up. Don't let them experience that. Don't let your teenagers dry up. Get them connected. So that's one of the things. The second thing that uh, was a, a causability factor is um, disillusionment. He was disillusioned with the life events. In verse number 10, he says, As with the sword crushing in my bones, my enemies taunt me and reproach me while they say continually to me, where is your God? They were disillusioned. You see, sometimes it's not because you're living in sin that you have a dry spot, a dry spell in your spiritual life. It could be just everyday living. Maybe your health is falling apart. My wife and I were talking on the way down, and, and uh, she was really taking care of her stepmother uh, for uh, a lot of years, and most recently, it's getting very difficult. And, and I even think about Leslie and, and her mother, and, and Shirley's stepmother passed away in June. And uh, my kid said to me one day, my three boys and the daughters-in-law said, you know, mom's getting a little bit negative, isn't she? And boy, you know, that kind of hurt. You start talking about my wife, and that's your mom. And, and I said, well, I said, you don't know, uh, you know grandma like grandma, she's real nice. You don't know the other part of grandma, <laughs> the part that we had to put up with grandma. We did it very graciously, but you see the, uh, the effects of life. Sometimes, and my wife, she said, you know, I was getting negative, and, and within the last two months since her, uh, her stepmother had been gone, her whole attitude's different. She's got her game face back on. Just events of life, maybe financial difficulty, maybe relationship, maybe divorce, whatever it may be. And you get dis disillusioned sometimes, and it really begins to affect you. I tell you, let me give you a good illustration of just events in life, how you lose your game face. Pastor and I play golf once in a while. We haven't played much this summer because I stay out of the heat with my heart condition. And, and, but most of the time, he beats me. And he really does. And um, though we love going out, boom, boom, boom. And, and uh, we have a lot of fun. And, so a couple of weeks ago, we was out at um, uh, Auburn Hills playing. And um, we both came with a game face on, as we always do. You know, we <clears throat> beat this course today. We'll beat you. And we, you know, back talk each other. We come, what kind of talk is that uh, you call it? What's that? Trash talk. That's what it is. I knew you knew what it was. And, and so we're, we're trash talking, you know. And, you know, we get down the road. He'll give me a mulligan. And I'll give him a mulligan, you know. And I'm... Well, I was just a practice swing. was not go ahead and hit the ball. So we come up on nine, and, and he was really having a difficult time. In fact, that was on number eight. I finally said to him, I said, man, where is your game? <laughs> you know, like, where is your God? Where is your game? 
and it began to show on his, his game face. It wasn't there. And we got a nine, a par five. And man, I had a nice drive, had a nice second shot. Third shot on. But it was probably as far as from here to, uh, to that uh, screen back there. There's quite a ways I'm going to have to putt for a birdie. And, and it, it's going uphill, and then it goes downhill, and then off to the right. It's a pretty long putt that I've got to make. And so he's down at the hole, and he's got the pin down there holding it for me, the flag. And, and so I hit the ball, and um, I didn't think I hit it hard enough because I didn't think it was going to get up over the hill. And so I'm standing back there by my putt, and he's down by the pin. And, and I said, hit the ball, hit the ball, hit the ball, stupid. And I was talking to myself. And it goes up to the top of the hill, and it starts over the crest of the hill and it's starting down and starting going to the right heading down toward the hole and all of a sudden boom in the hole birdie <laughs> he's standing down hit the ball hit the ball hit the ball stupid <laughs> you talking about a game face change man now you got the sermon everybody got the sermon that's the way it worked and I said to him where is your game so he said well we'll go to the back nine I'll find it over there hit the driver and popped it up that right down front of so that's all right. So, so I shot a I shot a 83 that day, and he shot I don't know 103 or something like that. So, <laughs> so we I get out to the car, and he leaves. I tell you, he peeled out of there. I could tell, man, he he was out of there. And so I put my scorecard up on my um, steering wheel, and I took a picture of it. And I sent it to a couple of my boys that play golf, and I sent it to my wife, and I said, what do you think? And my wife said, man, I was praying all morning you'd beat him. <laughs> wow, what a wife, huh? <laughs> Boy, you talk about a game face there. <laughs> man, I left. I was as happy as could be at Pastor Bruce. I don't know. I don't know where he ended up. <laughs> Oh, you know, this is, this is fun. It really is. <laughs> All right, now let's get back to serious business. All right. The last point on your notes there, C, he was deprived of life's necessity. Notice he says, my tears have been my food day and night. He wasn't eating. He wasn't sleeping. There is a physical aspect of what we're going through. You may lose weight. You just can't sleep at night. And you just can't, um, you can't eat. Now let's go to the cure, hurriedly, the cure. Uh, David is singing the blues. Lost the face of God, lost the reality of God, spiritual drought, darkness. What does he do? Read the Bible more, pray more, go to church more, give more to the offering. Now I would put that one in there. <laughs> Meditating. No, that's not what he's doing. Now, this is a cure. Now he's going to the doctor. If you're in a dry spell today in your life, just follow what David is doing here in this scripture. The first thing he does is he remembers God's grace in the past. He remembers, he said, I remember going to the house of God. I remember leading the musicians. I remember doing that. In verse number four, he says, these things I earnestly remember and pour myself out within me. He remembered what it was like in the past. The second thing, he analyzes his hope in the future. He looks at the future. Verse number five, why are you cast down, O oh, my inner self? Why should you moan over me and be disquieted within me? Hope in God and wait expectantly for him. He analyzes his hope in God. I've been there at that time, and I just had to have hope in God expectant hope in God. I know he is going to work it out for me in the long run. Some of you have lost loved ones recently. I've had three or four funerals lately. Pastors had some. You really have to trust God. You have to have an earnest hope in him. Analyze the hope for the future. And the third thing, which is the most important thing, he poured out his soul to God. 
No, he didn't pick up the Bible and go to John chapter 10. He didn't go there. He could have. Nothing wrong with that. He didn't get out on his knees and pray. He could have. He poured out his soul. Verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my inner self? And why are you... And why should you moan over me and be disquieted? You know what that word disquieted means? It means why are you agitated? Why is there rage within my inner self? Why is there a commotion going on within my life? Why don't I have peace and tranquility and joy? Where's my game face? Where's it at? Where's it at? The thing I like about this scripture is Psalms chapter 42, the last verse in Psalms chapter 43. When I, when I first saw this many, many years ago, um, 83, 84, that's a lot of years ago, I read this scripture in Psalms 43, verse 5. And, and there in David said, Who, God, who is the health of my countenance. And I thought, God heals me. He heals my face. He heals my countenance. And I, I, will, I surely will point out to people in my discipleship class, she'll bring pictures of me and say, this is what Al looked like before God really worked in his life. And this is what he looks like today. And God just healed my countenance. He healed my person. I was able to have a game face, a spiritual swagger, not egotistical, but confidence of who God is, and what God can do in my life. It's a spiritual swagger that we have. It's a countenance. God is the healer of my countenance. You remember we talk about all issues come from the heart, and all of that acid, and all of that rage, and, and all of that uh, commotion comes out of our lives. And God is the one that healed David. It wasn't reading the Bible again. It wasn't praying. Those are great things to do. Those are disciplines. He needed a doctor. The doctor came, healed his countenance, healed his life. Individually, I hope that this message today will encourage you. If you're in a dry spell in your life, challenge you. But as we close, I want to talk just a little bit about the face of the church. See, in going on 50 some years of pastoring there were times when I would walk in our church in Valley Center and I would stand in there and I'd watch people come in and I want to tell you something you know maybe we lost some people you know people come and go when it comes to church I learned a long time ago you don't hang on to people if, if you did that it'd just drive you crazy um, back in 19... Uh, 60. My wife and I were going to the Wellington Place Baptist Church up on 21st Street. And the pastor, Vernon Refner, was a second cousin of mine. And, <clears throat> and he made mention of this. He said, back then, every seven years, your congregation changes. You have a core group that may be there for 10 years, 15 years, or 20. But every seven years, he said, I pastor a whole new congregation. You know what, today, it's probably about every three years you have a new congregation. There's a core group that stays. And sometimes when people come and they go, we get down, we get discouraged, and we lose our game face. And when people walk in here, uh, you know, when we walk in, we don't have that swagger. We don't have that Glenville swagger. You know what that Glenville swagger is? Just watch pastor sometimes. He's got a swagger to him when it comes to the Glenville swagger. But it is a confidence that we have that we want to be here and we like what's happening here. And it doesn't make any difference what life events are. Maybe my best friend has just left, but that, my life is built around Jesus Christ, not necessarily my best friend. And so we lose the swagger. We lose the game face. And so as we get ready to um, uh, connect you, uh, help you to get a game face, and not only do we have this signing up, but we have other things for uh, financial peace to get signed up, that uh, small group. And those of you that really want to get involved in this church, 
Uh, we're signing up for the new connection class, and we'll be starting the third week in September. If you're new, come, and we'll spend three weeks, and we'll talk about how you can get the Glenville Swagger. Come in here, be involved in what we're doing. And you know, we need the Swagger. Here's what I hope. I, I think God has great things for Glenville Church. And I really believe that we come in here, we deal with our own personal lives, we cry our soul out to Him. I believe when people walk in here that are visiting, we have hundreds of visitors that come to this church. Oftentimes they do not stay. I don't know what the percentage is, but you know why they don't stay? Because when they get here, they don't see the game face. They see us sometimes, we're down, the music wasn't right, the temperature wasn't right, they didn't talk to me, they didn't do this, I didn't get this right, uh, my chair isn't quite straight. And so they walk in and say, you know, if that's what Christianity is all about, I don't really need that. I don't need it. <laughs> if you, so, the swagger. I want to challenge our church, not only personally to deal with their own lives, but for our church to have that game face. That when people walk in here, I didn't get an amen out of you at all. Would you do? All right. When people walk in here, when people walk in here, when they walk out, they can say they had their game face on. I don't have to ask, where is God? I felt his presence there. I felt his hands. I saw God. I saw it in the people at Glenville. Father, thank you for this time that you've given me to speak. God, I never take that for granted. Thank you for everything that you've done in my life. I love you so much. And Father, I love this church. And Father, I, I think that we've, we've got a game face. And Father, maybe we can just increase it. Father, we want to see the face of God. We want our church to see the face of God. We want to see the presence of God. And Father, when we go to the river, we want to drink from the living water of Jesus Christ. In his precious name I pray, amen.